We're very excited to have Lou here. Um, she's had a very illustrious career in teaching and in many media. And um, take it away, Thank Lou. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deborah. Thanks to the gallery. Thanks all of you for coming. Um, it's always an, a treat to be able to share my work. I think most artists feel that way, and I'm especially happy to be back here on Bainbridge Island at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts uh, in this, uh, for me, lovely new space. It's my first time to be at the gallery since the interior was um, reformulated, and so it's quite a treat. Um, I love questions. And some of you have had a chance to see the work already, and I know some of you have not. So what I thought I'd do today is give you just a short context of the origin, my origin story of the work. And um, I, I can show you um, my herbarium press, which is how I prepare my botanical specimens. And then I really would like questions. So. Um, I'm pretty unflappable, so when you think of your question, if you could call it out, um, so we have it in, in our shared uh, experience, I would appreciate that. And if the answer is long or will take me off track, I will say, great question, I'll you know, hold, hold that thought and move forward. Okay, so uh, we've got a deal, I hope. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So the two, the two pieces I have uh, here in this particular exhibition are the flashcards that are titled uh, Words Every Child Has a Right to Know, which are handset, letterpress, printed flashcards in two volumes that document some of the words that have been um, edited out of the Oxford Junior Dictionary since 2007. Um, in the, and the Junior Dictionary is the hardcover uh, dictionary, hard, hard copy dictionary that Oxford uh, University Press produces for uh, the under 11 year olds. Um, and these are words that the, when there was an outcry about these words that describe the countryside or the natural world, um, when there was an outcry about their elimination from the, the children's dictionary, the, um, the uh, justification given by the editors was that these words were deemed irrelevant to the lives of children under 10, uh, which of course breaks a lot of our collective hearts. So when I learned about this, um, I, I thought flashcards. I just knew that, that one thing I could do in response was make flashcards. Did, was there a question? Are you telling me that otter and porpoise were words that were taken out of the dictionary? Yes, they're, they're not in the children's dictionary uh, produced by Oxford. Um, acorn, minnow, mm -hmm. pelican, brook, uh, bl blackberry, bramble, etc. And words that were added, uh, you know, in that space vacated are words like attachment, chat room, a meme, et cetera. So um, you can, uh, Robert McFarlane, the author, um, has written quite extensively about this. So if you want to you know, check out what he has to say about the rewilding of language in general, I highly recommend you know, following some of his articles in The Guardian. Um, I also am represented in this show with this piece, which is called um, The Herbarium of Useful Plants. I've become really, really passionate, I guess. I, that's a word that wanted to come out of my mouth. Unmasked. Um, <laughs> um, with, with botanical specimens and the scientific practice of creating herbarium sheets. So an herbarium refers to not only the sheet um, of very heavy stock, very, very rigid paper stock, upon which a dried botanical specimen is mounted and labeled, right, for study, for preservation, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, I think a lot of us find this historic format really quite beautiful, and the goal is, even the scientific goal for creating herbarium sheets is to mount your specimen in an aesthetically pleasing way. That's actually part of some of the traditional um, you know, instruction for this. I've done several pieces in which I, I start with the herbarium format and then make it my own. In this case, I wanted to <sighs> cultivate, sensitize myself, whatever verb uh, would fit in there, as an urban girl to really deepen my own relationship with the natural world that is right literally in the cracks of the sidewalk in front of my house, you know, along in my alley, et cetera, et cetera. And so I began, I had no idea whether this would be something anyone else would want to look at. I began to gather plants within, I began by gathering plants within a five block radius of my house, um, pressing them in, a, in an herbarium press that allows me to take a larger botanical specimen and maybe a more complex specimen than I could put in my yellow pages or my dictionary, right? And then mount it on this good sturdy um, card but instead of doing the scientific, uh, very precise, very clinical labeling, I began to label the plant um, as, as an autobiog in an autobiographical way, if you will, with where this plant lives in my neighborhood and then my relationships, which are, you know, uh, to the plant. And so this herbarium of useful plants has 15 sheets in it, I think of it as a one-of-a-kind book that is unbound, right? So the pages are loose. And the gallery has put four of the specimens on display. You all can check them out. Um, but I thought I'd show a few of them. So you all came. So I always like to give the folks who show up, right, a little extra. Yes, question? Oh. Get those inspiration for you or point of departure? Thank you. That's a great question. Yes, yes, absolutely. The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I've done a deep dive into the history of herbals, the history of plant identification, visual plant identification, and early botanical uh, herbarium uh, collection, early botanical illustration, and honestly, what, you, what I'll show you here, my approach is entirely informed by those early, I would say pre-scientific codified, pre-Linnaeus oh, okay. uh, uh, practices, where the, the plant hunter, the botanist, the person interested in understanding the natural world um, would press, their plus, press plants or make a drawing and include their journal entry, include, you know, incredible amounts of things. They would return to, the, return to the specimen and add other specimens. Paper was expensive. You would have what we would now call a collage effect with uh, sheets that could be lifted up and open in order to conserve the paper. I take great inspiration from those and, and, and hope honestly hope that we could all do that because it's a sign of the personal relationship that is being documented, but also I know from making these that personal investment, that personal relationship with the natural world that is literally at your feet grows, right, just, just by the act of wanting to document it, right? So this is, um, this is Oregon grape, north side of John's driveway. So that's, that's just how specific this labeling is. John's been there a long time. And it's been there a long time. John is oblivious. As far as he's concerned, it's most, its biggest job is to make sure the neighbors don't see him coming and going, and he doesn't have to look at them either. Um, but, um, you know, it's an herbal preparation. It's been discussed as a remedy. 
in you know 1930s Mrs. Greaves herbal and then I did draw so so my collages if you will often include my own drawings great question so that's the Oregon grape um, let's see what else did I pull for us oh great question so we'll take a look at the back of blackberry leaves um, how they're mounted is after I dry the specimen I mount them with white glue is the traditional material. I use bookbinders glue because that's what I have a lot of. Um, and I use a sponge. So you take your dried specimen upside down on newsprint or other absorbent paper. Sponge that you've kind of dipped into your white glue. Tap, 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 tap. And lay it down. On the, hmm? the yes, yeah, so, so the, the glue is on the back of the botanical, or the, the part of the botanical specimen you do not want to see, that you're going to hide. And then I like to use the traditional form of stitching. I mean, I do have a history in fibers, and, and, but this is, this is a traditional method of, of further securing the type of the part of the plant that the glue is probably going to be inadequate for. Um, in this case, I am showing you the back of the blackberry because when I collected blackberry to dry it, I learned, you all probably know this, I didn't grow up in the Northwest, there's actually spines on the back of the leaf. No matter, no, no wonder they're so pernicious. And so I, I drew this one to show you because it does have my great grandma's recipe wow. here for um, blackberry cake. <laughs> um, and this is a blackberry reversed alley and when I gathered it, my, the alley behind my house. But also the blackberry is very contentious. It's a point of contention in my neighborhood. And so I also I wrote, this is a story, a short vignette of, those, of that animosity that exists and, and kind of came to a head in my alley with the blackberry. And before you go more technical, Sure, sure. Oh, okay, so these, so it, on this sheet, these are mounted with um, a pressure adhesive that comes in a sheet, Goody, which I do, I get from Talus Bookbinding Supply. It comes in sheets and, uh, you know, you, with, when you use pressure, it's burnish. activated. You burnish, you burnish it on. And I like it because it doesn't add water to the paper, which can cause the paper to get wonky and because it lays nice and flat. And also with process, um, are they sealed at all? I mean, plants dry out and that's a, color. That is a great question. I'll just let you see one more while I talk. Um, that's a great question, and it was, um, the answer is I do not, I don't do anything that the classic method of mounting or herbaria is not to do this. Again, classically, like with artist books as well as with herbaria, they are not, they're not hung on the wall and exposed to light, right? You know, they live in a stack in a closed container and are enjoyed one page at a time. Does that make any sense? So, so the, and they will discolor over time. And I had, um, there were two botanists here in the gallery at the end of the opening last night who kind of confirmed all of that. Oh. that um, at the most, the herbarium sheets are, are placed in folders such as, such as this one. Otherwise, they're just stacked on top, in, in short stacks on top of each other and kept out of the light, except when they're being enjoyed or studied. So thanks for asking. Um, this is a grape, grapevine that, again, includes a recipe and my own notations about, about cooking with the grapes. Um, I did offer to talk about the herbarium press that I use. When I got interested in this, was, which initially was because I really love to draw plants, and I'm really slow. I'm really slow at drawing, really slow. <laughs> and the plants change really quickly, really quickly. And my teacher in botanical illustration, bless her, had all kinds of tricks involving ice cubes in your refrigerator. and timing and I thought, oh, no, this is not going to work. So, um, so I learned how to dry plants and I was doing this 
And um, a botanist neighbor turned me on to the, um, the official herbarium press. And I really like it because it has allowed me to press, as I said, larger specimens and more complex, maybe more layered specimens than it would. And herbarium presses are made up of these wooden, two wooden um, grids like this. Uh, and then you, you make basically a sandwich um, of absorbent surfaces, such as, let me get this down here. That is all set up. You want to put your botanical specimen in um, newsprint, lay it out, make it flat. They really, th these are very unnatural. <laughs> Somebody said, you know, those, the, the medieval woodcuts really did a disservice to the natural world in some ways because they're so oversimplified. But anyway, you lay out your, your specimen as, as uh, flat as possible. You put it in this um, folder. And then you make a sandwich. This is sitting on top of blotters. You put that newsprint, your botanical specimen is in the newsprint. It's between two layers of blotting paper, which are then bet between two layers of um, corrugated cardboard. So this is, this is maximizing the absorbent layers as well as maximizing the airflow, the, which the corrugated cardboard provides. If you have a um, if you have a really bulky specimen like um, like that Oregon grape or like roots like I'll I'll collect roots and split them down the middle and dry them um, you do the same thing you can put it in its newsprint but there are these foam surfaces that you can uh, cushion your specimen, foam, blotter, newsprint. Does that make sense? You're basically making a sandwich that is, um, max again, maximizing the absorbency and the airflow. And after all of that is done, you put the grid back on top, and you have straps and you strap it down. So these, these can grow quite high. Um, um, so in here, the, the great question, how long, how long does it take to dry the specimens? Um, a week to 10 days in the summer. Uh, summer tends, tends to be when I do this. I think that's when the plant material is really available and pliant, and you do want to um, not let them over dry. I have found you don't want them to over dry because then they get difficult to uh, get the adhesive on. They're brittle, if that makes sense. Yeah? Is there ever an interesting ghost of the plant on the uh, newspapers? Uh, so the ghosts of <laughs> press plants are so marvelous. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so marvelous. They, um, I haven't been doing this long enough. To have got to have gotten ghosts in 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 my press, just if that makes any sense, because uh, you do want to get them out of there because you you you've got something else you want to do with it. But the the ghost um, I have seen in like the Victorians um, would put their botanical specimens in books, in albums, and so they so you had absorbent paper in contact right with that botanical specimen for over a period of time. And then you've got a ghost. The herbarium sheets, because I, I draw a lot in herbaria from herbarium sheets. And this paper must not be very absorbent, because I have not seen like the, the official herbarium sheet pick up. You know, a botanist may have other experiences with that. I haven't seen that pick it up. But the, the um, albums made by folks um, have those. Also, for some reason, seaweed. The seaweed herbarium sheets um, 
I have, have a, I ha that's where I've seen that ghost effect, which is so beautiful. That's, but that's, you know, we all know that's, that's really 20th and 21st century eyes that see that as beautiful. Right, I mean, we just have to remember the 19th century would want a little, they would want that crisper, they would want that cleaner. Can you right. see that ghosting effect? Is it a combination of colors in the plant matter and like an embossing kind of thing when it does happen? That's such a great question. I'm assuming, I have always assumed that it is a combination of colorant and whatever it is that causes paper to fox. You know, to use an archival, to, you know, like foxing on paper or textiles will pick up rust stains because the ghost, the uh, ru rusty color, I don't mean that it's actual rust, it's rust color. Because the ghost images I've, I have seen have all been rust colored. So I've assumed it's, it's related in some way to contact with an organic thing, to, you know, that produces that kind of color. Um, embossing, though, embossing does happen on the, the blotters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yay. So, other questions? Yeah. <laughs> well, I know this one. Do you it, finish? Do you finish it with anything? Um, you know, to preserve it. Or? Uh, no, I don't. And like I said, the the botanists that were here uh, last night did mention that there is some new research being done to see if there is some um, uh, chemical or, or or treatment that can be added to to preserve, but I do not. I, I, I sort of like to live without a net. Um, and um, I figure, like I've, I've made drawings from botanical specimens that were collected in 1875. So, uh, you know, I think these are gonna be okay. <laughs> I mean, I, and I don't mean to make little of, of, the, of the question, because we're here in an art gallery, and that is an extremely valid question. But that was, that's where my personal choice of presenting these herbarium sheets as an unbound book with pages that can be looked at individually and kept, you know, in, uh, in a container. So I, I'll, I'll, put out, I'll put this out there. Um, I'm sort of hoping maybe that the gallery could rotate the sheets that are out so that those four aren't subject, you know, aren't the only ones subject to, to the lights. I mean, I think that might be fun for the folks who visit, but also it would be healthy. Yeah, we can uh, do that. Yeah, and it, it's, it's a good practice, I think, for lots of book arts kinds of, kinds of things. I did, oh, Another question? I just wondered how you limited yourself on plants. I mean, how, you oh. there, there are 15. So did you do it like for two weeks I'm going to gather, or how did you decide? Oh, that, that's, so, that's so great, a question. Um, no. I, um, so the, the actual origin story starts with my residency at the Bloedel, where um, my colleague and I, we did a joint residency and we were asked to do a workshop, and so we developed a workshop of, of essentially making autobiographical herbarium sheets. And then and I made the samples, like she was pulling together a, a certain amount of data, and I made samples to show, and I made like four, or five, I just figured I'd make two or three samples that we could have in, for people. And I couldn't stop, I just couldn't stop. So I had eight samples and, uh, samples, and I just loved them. And those are the, those are the eight um, herbarium of useful plants that are on my website. And then I just kept, I just kept making them until I ran out of steam, honestly. Thanks for asking <laughs> that question. I also will say, I started out with this five, five block radius idea, and I'm, I'm afraid it's gotten like, uh, there's a groove in my, in my brain and voice. But what actually happened when I expanded uh, is that these are, these are 
plants collected within my daily radius. So I realized, as someone actually pointed it out last night, that I, I have, there, there is a, a botanical sheet that I collected at the uh, Union Bay natural area where I walk every day. That's, that's well beyond five blocks of my home. Um, and uh, nettle, um, f fertile as my alley is, nettle does not grow there. <laughs> Um, but, but nettle is from my, uh, actually my friend who built this box and whose uh, letterpress shop I did, I printed the, um, the cards in. Um, she, she has a good, healthy crop of nettles. <laughs> so, but these are places that are so embedded in my daily round, if that makes any sense. So, and then, and then I don't know, it's kind of like any art, like when are you done? Like I just knew I was done and I needed to be done with this. I'm certainly not done with the herbarium sheet as a format, but yeah, good. Do you have one book? Pardon me? Do you have how many books? I, I, well, there, this is one artwork with 15 sheets in it. Um, I have also used the herbarium format for a piece that's owned by Bima my herbarium of martyrs, those are, those are drawings, uh, stitched, embroidered drawings of plants used in phytoremediation to take toxins out of the soil. I also used the herbarium sheet in my piece called The Making of a Meadow, which will be in Tacoma at the University of Puget Sound show in October, where I documented my own um, experience of the Union Bay natural area where I where I walk daily and I I collected specimens and drawings from there so I love the format D did I answer your question but this is just one piece yeah, one piece. And, and so, yeah you have that. with 15 parts yeah, okay. 15 pages I I did say something about my um, my I also use the herbarium method in an album I'm very Victorian I guess I'm just you know I like get another life um, <laughs> And so when I redesigned my gardens, I started these um, altered books. I keep altered books for my sketchbooks, but I do use um, uh, the botanical specimen in, in these, um, these journals, um, large scale as well as small. And uh, within this, this altered book, there is my herbarium of sorrows. And um, so th this is the one weed that I was allowed to take from the Bloedel. You can't take specimens from the Bloedel, which I, for, I, for, for all the right reasons, I would, you know. But I, the gardener did give me this one weed <laughs> <laughs> on my last day. <laughs> Social capital, you know. Was, Thank you, Mom. I, I don't know. It's just a weed. Oh. Sorry. It's that Pardon? Yeah. And but the problem is that there is there is a fungus at the Bloedel that they are trying to contain, and this weed came from the one plot that they know does not have it. And another uh, one of my herbarium of sorrows. And, and here I have used the traditional uh, labeling, although, although I've just told my story, I've just used the label as a nice thing to have lines on, mm -hmm. right, to write. Um, this is a, a specimen from my New Zealand tree, which we placed in, at the entrance to my house because the, um, the ornamental planting that was there uh, was not drought tolerant enough, and the New Zealand um, botany survive, is, is, uh, flourishes in our newly changing climate. So anyway, I, I really love this method, and I want to encourage you all, thank you all for coming, and um, please enjoy the work, and we get to hear from Bill next. Any last questions? The, the martyrs, because they, they see it's the phyto yeah, so, so the piece that's up that is not on display at the moment, but uh, Bima owns, the Herbarium of Martyrs is 12 plants um, 
that are known to effectively remove toxins from the soil or groundwater. And I'm not interested in wishful thinking. I think the arts have a lot to answer for in providing too much in the way of wishful thinking. Um, and so the, the herbarium sheets I made with my drawings of these plants has their label gives the very specific place where they have effectively, does that make it, you know, removed the toxins. So there's um, sunflowers from Chernobyl, there's, um, uh, there's a plant that removes nickel from the soil in a World War I uh, ammunition dump and can be mined. So they, they harvest the plant and, and burn it, and they have the nickel left. Um, and I called these plants martyrs because I wanted to remind us all that there's no free lunch. These plants are not going to save us. They will remove the toxins and become toxic themselves. So then they must be handled as toxic waste, right? And you have to be careful that the birds don't eat the seeds. And, 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 so that, so that was where the concept of martyr, um, you know, came up and they'll do it. This is just, this is what they do. They, they absorb these certain nutrients or, you know, but it's, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. I, we've got. Thank you so much. social things and how we, you know, the rose is the, the valentine plant, right? So um, I've, uh, you'll see them all in these four works that are in the gallery today, uh, this month. Um, and it ranges from something as light hearted as showing a, a depiction of garlic with a metallic uh, incised drawing of garlic. Um, and just on that kind of basic level is a love of garlic, and it's called A Handful of Day, and um, part of that is that I really love garlic, <laughs> and no recipe I've looked at tells you to use enough garlic. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so that's what, and, and it's good for you. So, but on the, on the other range of things, um, on the social range, I have humor. So this is a piece from the wall that I, I, I enjoy. And this is, uh, I love it if, if people can figure out what it's about on their own, but since I have you here. <laughs> um, this is just a, a fun piece about the hotness of peppers. So the hotter peppers tend to be more colorful and they're smaller, thinner, longer sort of things. And what is that temperature? It's not a Kelvin scale, it's a very special um, degrees of peppers that someone must know. <laughs> I've forgotten already, but yeah, well, so, so, you know, you know, jalapeno peppers are very, you know, you got to be careful with how to handle it and how directly you eat it. Um, but this is about relationships and the, the sort of not life cycle per se, but, but sort of the, the getting to know you phase is here where the pepper is very hot and it's being sliced and it falls down and it becomes a wedding ring. So I'm traditional that way, I suppose. And then over time it becomes a poblamo, still lots of flavor, and then you get your, your garden <laughs> variety um, pepper, which is green, red, and things like that. So, um, but this is also the plant, what the, the leaves would look like, and the, the baby peppers that are now being produced. So this is a fun, humorous take on that. Sure. Well, it's a Scoville scale. Right. Unit, so it's S H U. So not just spicing it. But it's really quite a difference between the hot and the not so hot. Yeah. But that's the comfort level of hopefully living with someone for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also uh, work 
on more serious issues from time to time because I like to change things up. And so, say a, a piece, uh oh, he stuck it to the wall, very good. Um, a piece like this, um, which is called Risky Gesture. So this is not a humorous piece at all, although it might take you a while to figure out that this is a soy plant, a soybean plant, and that over the last 20 to 30 years, I would say, soybeans have become a very accepted part of the American diet. But it used to be more pure, and it uh, has been affected strongly by GMO type of companies so that they make sure that it produces enough and things like that. I have a piece at BEMA um, that has to do with uh, uh, called American Peas, and it, it shows a whole row of, of peas on the vine, and you can then see all the peas inside and then the bowls that they're filling, and that some of the peas are empty or they're missing peas, and the whole idea is, like with this one, is, you know, in farm, real farm times, you didn't always have the, the perfect crop, but through the um, miracles of science, um, they produce more often, but not necessarily better. So we have to be careful of that, that sort of thing in our diets. So this one also has features, these are like enlarged soybeans being shaken, and because the bees are attacking him, the bees are endangered. I often use endangered um, uh, species of plants or um, uh, animals and things like that. So this is a butterfly. One of my favorites from California was a monarch. So um, they're endangered as well. So it's, it's attacking the hand, which has a tattoo on it. And I'm hesitant to say it to everybody, but that's the tattoo is actually the uh, logo of Monsanto. So, so my criticism tends to be a little subtle, <laughs> but it's there. So it satisfies me, I guess, inside as an artist. So that's the, the type of political uh, and environmental commentary that I do sometimes. But my origins have been with these examples here, metalsmithing, um, coming from jewelry, uh, enjoying to fabricate things, hitting things with a hammer and forming them. So a lot of people don't really know what that involves, and it's very involved, it takes a long time. And um, so here are, I've been moving home and studio and storage, and it just so happens that there's a bunch of things that uh, I hadn't finished or decided, no, that's not the right time, I'll move on, but then I forgot about it, things like that. So um, these are the basic tools for all, all the production of what I do are, when I use the word steak, it's not, it, it's, people don't really know what I'm talking about. So this is what a typical steak, a very common steak for a silversmith studio would be, and they come in many, many forms. And they're heavy. They're steel. Yes, Lou. So, so Bill, then, um, then the the, the, the long mm -hmm. part that goes into some form of vice. Right. These are tea stakes. So it either goes into a vice, so uh -huh. you crank it in and out, and then hit <laughs> uh -huh. hit hard one end or the other, so you have two here, uh -huh. or it goes into a a, a holder. A block. Of right. Holder. And that's good for classes in particular because you can get a number of them on a table. Right. And you do have to change out your steak frequently to get that next little mm -hmm. curve or angle that you're going for. <laughs> and then the other, so you're used to a, a, a silver, I'm sorry, a blacksmith's anvil. So they're big and heavy and they're on a big stump. But those are big and heavy and hard to move around. So there are also other stakes for the lighter work of it, but similar work. And so this would definitely go in a vise but it's a flat steel surface. It's really built to absorb a lot of pounding. And there's an example here. So this is almost a common sort of way to raise. We call it, this is raised. And I had studied to be a silversmith, but you might take a, a thick sheet and you just literally start pounding 
that's going to fall over, so I'm not going to really do it. But um, you, you use something like this, and you just start to go concentrically so that it moves the metal up and out and starts to form. Um, that takes a lot of brute force. You can kind of see how big the hammer marks are in there because you're hitting so hard. So you do that once, you have to stop because you'll either damage yourself because it'll be stronger than you or you'll damage the metal itself. At some point you can crack it and you can never really get that out. So you anneal it. You take it to your oxyacetylene and you do it to a nice gentle reddish glow, um, which is a challenge for a color challenge person like me, but you can do it in darkness is the easiest way. Then you put it in pickle and clean it and you're ready to go again. So it's a very slow process. So something like this takes a very long time. You can see the similar sort of working as, it, as I was bringing it in. And what was big at the time was doing asymmetrical forming. So it, symmetrical is kind of easy. You just keep on that same trajectory. But if it's asymmetrical, you're, you, you need to plan to go in more here and not as much here. But on the bottom, it's more refined because I'm not going to be able to get back in there. Do you have a question? Uh, question. Does this seem like, a, like an ancient process? Right. Like hundreds of thousands of years? Well, I don't know about the hundreds of thousands of years, but certainly back to the Renaissance um, and uh, in India, certainly way far back. Um, and the tools have not changed all that much. Certainly the, the working of it hasn't. Um, when I was starting out, I did work, I was coming from jewelry, getting interested in the larger forming um, metal smithing, but it was more towards silver smithing. But we did make our own ingots at one time, especially in gold. You try it in <coughs> silver too, but I remember making wedding rings in several different colored golds and then refining it enough to make it into a ring. Yes? Is that brass? This is brass. Well, and, and that's one of those things people always want to know, how long did that take you? But I hate punching a clock like that because while you're waiting for that to happen, you might go to a different piece and do something over there. So it's kind of hard to start tracking that. Um, so, and at this point, I don't keep track like that. I used to. But, um, and you used to, and I used to because I had the desire to be a silversmith where I could give a quote if I were to get a commission. Um, the, the problem was when I was a silversmith, like that, <laughs> um, this is like quintessential Scandinavian modern with your mirror surface, which takes a long time to achieve while not uh, scarring and getting too thin. Um, this is a creamer. Um, I had wine glasses. Uh, I had, uh, I guess you'd call them prototypes that I had in galleries in New York City and San Francisco um, right after undergrad school, before I really knew how to do the silversmithing. I went to graduate school and, and picked up more of that from Hans Christensen, who's, who brought in Danish um, silver to, to American schools, uh, along with a few others like Jack Pripp. But I got scared because someone might order 12 of them. Because if you're going to have wine glasses, you know, you want to have a party and you want 12. And, and I had ma managed to make two that were fairly identical. But I realized I don't like to do that. And that's not my personality. So I'm glad that that never happened. I still have those as prototypes and they're great examples of something I can do. But I'm glad that I didn't take that direction. The other thing that happened is at, uh, in the middle of graduate school, um, there was a national competition um, that would happen every year, uh, the sterling silver uh, competition, and it was held in New York City, and it was national. And I had gotten my silver to do my piece because I had planned it out, and the uh, silver market was cornered in uh, 1980. And 
I had bought my silver before Christmas and the Hunt brothers did their thing during Christmas and by the time everyone came back in January, half the students couldn't afford, it went from $50 an ounce to, I'm sorry, $5 an ounce to 50. And to do something, mine was this size. <laughs> that takes a lot of silver. Um, so it, that competition stopped within a year. It's never been run again which is very sad, um, but it was like the thing to go for as a graduate student uh, to get into that show. Um, but I love the process, so I switched to, these are all non-ferrous. So even, even the nickel, it doesn't work quite the same. This, is, this grayish one is nickel silver, um, but uh, brasses and coppers, and I say that because there are differences in, in the composition. Um, a red brass is gorgeous, but n not as common. Um, they work the same, you can use the same tools, um, and you can uh, join them with the same solders, silver solders. Um, so I, had, I brought a sample, just different samples that you could look at later about, you know, how, how that looks, you know, that that's just going to take a long time, or how to create sort of a, uh, um, a tube with a seam and that was in process. I just found these. I don't know what I was trying to do at the time, but this is one that I found that I had done, so you can just see the seam, partly because it's a little bit dirty, but, um, and then it has a very nice but very precise top, and that still matches up with the seam. So all of that is sort of the jeweler person um, doing metalsmithing, and that's there's an element of that in most of my work. Like the butterflies are often um, married metals, so they're not just applied, they're literally cut out, fit in, and soldered, and then smooth. So you see it from both sides. And I just like that kind of element still to do. Um, and then the, the, the broader strokes of, of you know, an arm or something might be very different. It's more like this. But bringing that up, I, I needed more content than just this is a beautiful um, utensil that can pour nicely and it holds a, you know, a cup and a half or whatever. Those, those were actually important things that, you know, when I did a ladle, it, it held a cup or something like that. But it didn't have meaning to me beyond a decorative thing and not wanting to do you know, repeating myself over and over again for a set of this or that, um, I started to, to work with things like content or, or different kind of decorativeness. Um, this was also the beginning of the era of the, uh, the vessel that didn't do anything. Um, so, and I was very attracted to rock forms and things. And one of the teachers that teaches at the same school that Lou does University of Washington, John Marshall had been, you know, an early model for me because he did exquisite jewelry that was very rock-like. And then he also did very large sculptural metal smithing, but in silver. Um, and those are commissions for sure. Um, but he, he had to develop new processes to work things larger. And then I've always kept relatively um, basic set of tools and worked in what I call an intimate scale. I do work three-dimensionally, like I've been making a series of busts um, which have to have internal structures to hold up. You know, this could be a face, you know, but there has to be something inside to hold it up and make it firm. And these are samples of tools. The, the, they get heavier the, the, the earlier you are in the process because you need to move that metal over a stake, you know. It would be something like that, and you're, you're hitting it just over the crest. Yes? This is such a dumb question, but like the one in your hand, what did it look up like at the beginning? Oh, it's just a flat disc. It was a flat, flat disc of, of uh, yeah, not square like that, but it would have been around. Okay. And um, the same for the, that was the whole, yeah, that, the whole end? The, well, no, well, well, this would have been a, a flat sheet, a yes. Flat sheet and then it gets brought around. Um, there you can uh, go over and over about how you like to layer it, um, whether you, you cut a little dovetail so that it fits really snugly and that your line is as thin as possible, or you can do a blunt one if you're, but when you're doing a spout for a coffee pot, which I did, um, you don't want to see 
those seams, but so you kind of do it on the underside. You have to pre-think that and make out a pattern um, and then have it fit to it. So it takes a lot of intricate fitting. So you have a, a dish. Mm -hmm. and so you dish it out first, much like this. If this were round, you would, that would be the start of this. Okay. And then you need to establish where your base is exactly. So you usually have a mark and uh, you know, use uh, dividers, markers. And then you, you do circles. And then you do one circle at a time all the way around. Then you go up to the next one. Because you're, you're not only you're, you're pushing it in, but you're also having to, to get it. Yeah. So technically, if you've done it right, it gets thicker the farther you go. Right, because it's compressing, and it almost doesn't feel like that makes sense, but it does get harder. But so I used to have to, traditionally, you, you really plan those out so that, um, because you don't want to lose that wonderful edge. Everything else can be very, very thin, and uh, I don't really like the tinniness of that thin. So a lot of my work, you'll see, even though I might have done a finger, it's actually covered most of it in back as well, which means I have crazy solder seams that you don't see. But that's because if you happen to just see over, you'll see that it's rounded. It's, it's like full. It's not like just a, a, you know, that edge. So, yeah. Um, but you use a series of hammers. So after, you, after a certain point, you wouldn't use such a heavy hammer. You start to use a thinner hammer that's lighter and a tighter and it won't leave, uh, it'll still move the metal, but it won't be as uh, damaging if you over, if you over hit. And you can hear that, and you can feel that mm -hmm. in both your hands and your, your so you'll, you'll know when you've gone too far. If you do it too often, you can, again, uh, damage the piece because later on, that will be in there, that little quirk where you hit it real hard for a while because your mind drifted off or something. So, and then in the, in the final stages you use, this is one of my favorites. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking. Just a quick one, Bill, I'm sorry. But, uh, explain the annealing process again. It's a double heat. You heat once and then and let it return to room temperature and then you heat it again. Is that basically what you did? Nope. Heat once and done. <laughs> is that it? Yeah, that's what I okay. have always done, the what I learned. Um, for large pieces in, a, in an institution where they have large amounts of uh, things for you, uh, people use two torches to heat it up because you want to try and heat it up at the same time. And we don't use ovens for that, so you try and do that with big things, but I don't. Um, so I just bring it up once. There's a lot of argument from when I was in graduate school about whether you quench which right. is to cool it quickly or let it cool on its own and then um, clean it, put it in the pickle. Um, but back when I was starting, part of the argument was it splatters when you just throw it in and we actually were using the real stuff. Since then, they, they developed synthetic acids cool. that won't eat holes in your clothes. <laughs> um, like sulfuric acid things? Yeah. yeah. Um, but they have synthetic now that won't. Uh, every now and then I remember uh, uh, doing laundry and saying, what, what are these holes? <laughs> so if you think about it, if that's your skin too, it's like, yikes. Yeah, um, but yes. Um, you described a little bit the process <laughs> I was thinking of that. Uh, I, I could go on and on probably because one, I'm mid 60s, <laughs> and two, I've been doing it over 40 years, and I, three, I still love what I do. So, um, but it, and it also keeps changing for me, which is what makes it continue to be exciting for me. Um, the question. Um, I guess I start with an idea. I don't fully draw them out anymore like this would have been, or this probably was, but I don't know where that drawing is. Although I see I was planning to cut that out. Now I'm not so sure I would take that out, but <laughs> that took a lot of work to get that. Um, 
And it, it, other than this one anyway, when I'd done a lot of the, the, the sort of silver smithing, it didn't have the kind of life that I wanted it to have because you were really trying to get it to that drawing and you kept comparing it and as you raised it up and it kept getting, you would mark that and you would do the process and then you figure out you need to start bringing that in a little bit early because then you're going to planish it which takes all those heavy marks out and creates those nice smooth ones by this hammer and that's little taps right on it to smooth it all out. So it, again, you can't spend any too much time in one spot because then you'll get a, like a blister or a bubble. So um, it didn't have the life that I wanted it to have, sort of like it didn't have the content that I wanted it to have. So I come up with ideas. I've often just had them almost fully realized in my head, although I will look around at a lot of materials and I take now, it's so modern, I'll take sketches with my phone. You know, I, I'll see a, a, an interesting visual and I'll take that picture and that will, you know, go into me and uh, I may or may not use that texture or those combinations, but I often do a very rudimentary uh, drawing, uh, a, lot, a lot of times with a lot of words to describe what it is that I'm thinking of when I did that. But I don't take much time to render what we used to call rendering, which was very precise for jewelry or for silversmithing, um, so that you could show a client exactly what they're going to get, that sort of thing. But drawing to me is also a little bit more lively. Um, has, you can take more liberties with it, but uh, if you just sketch, you have even more liberties. And with the words, you kind of can remember what you were feeling and what made that seem like that would be a great thing to make. Then I start working on size, what, what would be good, um, and then arrangements. Because things continually arrange over time. There's a dialogue that I like with the metal um, and then with the elements. So for, this was an example I brought because, you know, this was like literally a rock, um, but it's made out of nickel and I started using a lot of um, mixed metals. So there's different metals spliced in early because you have to get that in before you've <laughs> done the rest of it. So you have to have an idea, but you also have to be allow for what happens might be more interesting than what you were thinking that you could do. Um, and so you just kind of go with those kinds of um, indications. And there are times when you just know that you shouldn't go certain places with them. So you might, might change that, or in this case, I'm not sure what happened. I might have used that end, I liked it, but all of a sudden I have all of this, and I could still use this because other, unlike glass, you know, this won't really get damaged, it won't break. Um, so easily. Um, yeah, I like the dialogue uh, and building the piece as I go. Yes? This is probably a really stupid question. But <laughs> am I right in that you're doing all of this cold, right? Cold method? Yes. You don't introduce heat until the very... Just when I need to soften it to move something. Oh. If I've worked it with a hammer, it's become hardened. Mm -hmm. And if I want it to go a little bit farther, I'll need to cool, uh, anneal it soften it and what that does is it um, when you hit it the molecules in there um, like go against each other and they become brittle but when you anneal it they realign and become soft. So. What is the pickling? Pickling, um, so I, I didn't pickle any of these so um, when you're working it when you heat it it gets really pretty dark and um, it can get crusty especially copper um, gets gets a, a lot of scale on it and even stuff that comes off of it. So you want to at least wash it, but you pickling goes right through that and gets to the metal and then you can, can wash it off. And then it, it's pretty clean after that and you can just go again as long as it's dry. So, so that's basically what I do. Um, It, that's just the term in the field is, is the pickle, but it's an acid. It's an acid, okay. like sulfuric? It used to be. Used to be. Yeah, now and it's a synthetic, yeah, yeah okay. because companies, yeah, you, there's different ones that you use. There's also one that works even better on nickel, but you, <laughs> nickel doesn't really anneal like the others, so it gets work hardened far too soon. Um, can't move it as far. Yes. So this is more of a, uh, 
internal question, maybe, but you, you talked really eloquently about what, and you used the word dialogue, but I, I was hearing that mm -hmm. over time, this dialogue with the metal comes up. Do you, do you find that dialogue in, the, in your works on the wall, mm -hmm. uh, the, is that dialogue like trans, are, are you like a fish trying to describe water? Do you, do you feel that that dialogue has, is, so, is so transparent to you as you're imagining your, does that, you know, as you get these ideas? Yeah. Or, or do you find yourself so familiar with your material that you can translate without even consciously thinking? Well, what often happens is you have to think a lot backwards. Ah, okay, so if you want something to do this, you have to know that you have to get in behind it to do certain other things before you get to see just what's on the surface. So there, a lot of, especially the three-dimensional work has to have supports um, that make sense that, you know, if it's handling or shipping or whatever, you don't want it to just, mm -hmm. you know, get hit and dented. Uh, and I unfortunately do a lot of extra work because I think, well, what I learned ages ago is you, you can fix this if it's dented, you go back in. So even with my uh, sculpture work, there's usually a way to get back in. Ah, Whereas a lot of sculptors that work in steel and other things, they don't care. They're not going back in. <laughs> yeah. Nor do they care how it's actually mounted on some sort of, uh, not pedestal, but something that makes it stand up. <laughs> Whereas there's still too much craft person in me to let that go. <laughs> and I like a nicer seam, and I, I used to use the word, uh, the fine tolerance of jewelry when I do my fabrication, like, like this one, you know, how that, how that is so tight. So, and that's just a personal preference, I guess. Yeah. Um, any other, yes? So you talked about seamingness. Mm-hmm. It, 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 yeah, it's joined through heat and solder, but it, 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 it takes patience to get a, a, a really uh, clean edge to each other, especially when you're, you're bending it around to, you know, to meet up again, that sort of thing. And then it, you're adding metal, so then you need to um, put this back on the stake and very carefully um, go back and forth to try and integrate it in, but you don't want to have a wide um, seam. So hopefully you've done most of that as much as you can on the inside to get it if you need to, but you might not be able to get it all the way if it's a if it's a a coffee pot with a large spout. You know it's hard to throw a flame in the inside that far, so you might have to go on the outside. But if you've prepared well and you've gotten wires to hold it down because it wants to bend and, and change with the heat um, and then you're concentrating on one spot and so it's going to change as you go. You can literally put uh, some solder on the edge and just draw it with the heat and it'll flow with you if you were patient enough and then sometimes you need to add a little bit more. So then you clean that off before you go you know, to refine it more like this. So, takes a long time <laughs> to, to learn it all. So, um, anyway, I do wall art and then I do some larger pieces. I've done some of this type of thing on a large scale where there's a piece in Cincinnati that's six feet across and six feet high and it has these kinds of elements jam packed and, um, a very lot of work, <laughs> much, much work, much time, but I do enjoy it. Okay, Guy? Do you ever work with assistants in hammering? No. <laughs> well, Sorry. largely because it takes two, it's hard to know what level they're at mm -hmm. in terms of, and then you also have to pay them for the time. I picture a samurai swordsmith working with acolytes. Yeah. That's a very, that's a very limited area. I don't know what that to. price structure is for acolytes. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, I, I've, 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 I
<laughs> yeah, and those swords go for a lot of money, I'll tell you. Especially if they're Makume Gani and they've been done the traditional way. It's, it's quite, and then just the polishing alone takes, yeah. So, um, no, I've never, plus I'm actually a tool abuser. A it, abuser? Yeah, see, if I, if I continued, if, if, I'm, if I continued in this vein, all of these, especially this one, would have to be mirror surfaced. They would all have to keep an incredible um, surface. You have to, uh, as far as I could tell, continually redo them, and it just is boring. And I'm so I don't. Um, and I, I also, you know, in that undergraduate school, uh, California College of Arts and Crafts, the building was not OSHA approved. <laughs> it was slated for a long time to come down, and. So there was no ventilation for the polishing. And I, I learned from the many, much polishing that something like this takes, I was actually allergic to that kind of dirt. So I just also decided that that's not worth it. <laughs> um, because I would have to do it as, as uh, you know, with mask and as much as I could, and then go wash myself several times trying to not break out. That's just not fun. So. A lot of assistants that go through there may be their, you know, their tool hygiene might be higher than mine. And, um, but I, I developed what I call a working patina. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't mind as much having um, the surface have texture. And you can also tell that it was made by hand. I mean, a lot of things, if you go to, uh, uh, what, is there still a Pier 1? <laughs> Sorry, uh, imports. Um, you, you, there's something so regular about some of that brass work that is that a machine doing that and is that really the the only surface I mean they use the big one so that you can see that it might be handmade but you know more likely it should have been this <laughs> or th these kind this is a planishing hammer and it comes in different domes very soft um, so that you can grade your grade the fineness as you go um, finer and finer this is off the wall, but I wondered if you like knights in shiny armor. Anymore. I didn't. You know, that's not what drew me. A lot of people are drawn to chain mail and, and all that kind of stuff, and, um, but no. Why no. did you draw, draw you? Um, I don't know. I've been making things since I was a kid. Uh, my mom often wondered the same thing. Um, <laughs> Moms do that. Because... Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I would maybe present her for her birthday with a, a piece of wood that had a, basically a little, like, cliffside house on it or something. She was living in Santa Barbara, and there were those sorts of things, driftwood. Um, and then I got into jewelry in high school, uh, casting, so you could uh, form things with wax, and you could make things far more, well, easier to, to do anatomy and wax, actually, than with these hammers, because these are kind of big bludgeon things, you know. And I've heard, I've, um, you, you mentioned this, Bill, but the sound must be really important to you. Like, mm -hmm. you, like it sounds right. Yeah. But, but I'm, so, I'm so slowly realizing that there must be sound all the time throughout your working method, yes? If you're when working. you're actually working, but there's a lot of time that you can't be working because you have to rest things. It, it needs a rest and get back in shape, right, for the next round, and that gives you a break. But you can't um, hammer forever, at least in my experience. It, it can damage you. You have to take care of yourself that way. But in way. the working moment, there's sound. It, it's, it, yeah, a lot of sound. And at, in an institution where there's other people yeah. or an organization, you know, um, there's a lot of sound. So those people probably wear muffs or various things. Um, but the sound is very important. You, you, you need to do it wrong so that you know how to not do that again. Um, but it takes a while to then also know how to pay attention and you can feel it. This is, it's like when I carry coffee, if I carry it in this hand, it'll spill. Because this, it, I won't, it's just, you know, when you walk, you, you also yeah. are very careful and you don't spill it. This doesn't do that. Because it's used to holding this, uh, you know. You know, while this one hits. Yeah. So this is the one with the finesse, and this is the vice. <laughs> and I can't seem to change that. So, you know. Do different materials have different harmonics? Brass, copper, nickel? Do they sound differently? Probably, as well as their thickness, though. Okay. So hitting something like this is going to sound different. Um, it's a, it's a, 
deeper, you just know that it's, it's heavy. But this is, this is fairly thin, and you'll hear that as a much higher pitch. Mm -hmm. But you still have to calibrate that you're hitting too hard or not hard enough. If you're not hitting hard enough, then it will also waffle, and it's not folding in okay. to itself to move forward, and that can cause a problem, too. So that just, just takes time, trial and error. Do you like the sound? I do. Yeah. I like the feel. I like the sound. Um, yeah. Polishing, I'm not crazy about. <laughs> so we've established that. So, yes? Um, I was reading about the Olympic medals and how the Olympic gold, silver, and bronze medals mm. and, and how they are, their proportion. I know that the gold medal is gold filled, the gold plate. Oh. And the silver medal is the only one that's actually pure silver. And the bronze medal is not bronze at all, it's red brass. <laughs> but I told you it was lovely. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess they had to make it look different from the gold because I don't oh. think that the bronze that you have mm -hmm. is not it's, that is so two gold, looking. yeah. Yeah. Now, are those metals all mass produced somehow because of the numbers that they, they have? have be, yeah. They have to be, yeah. yeah. I would imagine they're cast uh -huh. from a mold, so they're all the same. Right. Um, it used to be a thing to aspire to, to do uh, ecclesiastical silver, uh -huh. either Jewish or some form of Catholic, um, and all of that, um, because they use chalices. I've designed, I've actually made one anyway. Um, and I designed one for the Unitarians here on the island that they didn't follow through on, but um, <laughs> not here, not here. <laughs> um, well, I was just going to say that uh, another form of that kind of uh, aspiring to are, are medals. Um, for certain types of achievement, for certain corporations might do it, um, where you would submit designs and you might make it that year. They might change them year to year and you might get that commission, which you'll make 10 of, and that's a good, you know, some work. Um, it's hard to get. So there are that type of thing. Yeah. And they're always finding bones and all sorts of things, I know. I love the fact that we don't know everything. <laughs> that, yeah, I, I like that we don't know everything. Um, I don't know how far back. I do know that some of my favorite stuff is uh, done, you know, and we, we have acetylene torches now, but they use blow torches to make that not that long ago. And they did exquisite and detailed work. I mean, uh, uh, not only reticulation, but, um, oh, I'm forgetting all of my, my terms, but um, granulation. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a technique where you might have, it would be gold, and you might have dots, mm -hmm. could be little squares or something, dots in, in, say, a little diamond shape, and you might have several of them over a surface. You put that in an oven, and you have to take it out at the exact moment that it fuses mm -hmm. without solder, and before it all melts. And that sort of thing is fascinating, but would just make my anxiety levels <laughs> so high. <laughs> um, and, then, and then you've ruined the gold. I mean, you can always reuse the gold because it would be pure to pure, but um, you can just get it back into an ingot and redo it. But you used to have to make it into an ingot, do all of this process just to make it flat so that then you can raise things up. So you did use a lot of shop people back then to do all that. Yeah. Any more questions? This has been fun because I rarely get to talk about this and I know that I say what I say to people in the abstract and they kind of go, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't know really what goes into the type of work that I do and not that many people do the type of work that I do. So. Process and inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Do you use that creamer at home? It is my personal creamer, but no, <laughs> I, I don't. My wife would actually like us to use it. <laughs> but I'm also afraid. Um, I haven't had much of my own work out in my home because I was raising children. <laughs> and um, they're gone now, so actually we've put a lot back out um, that I've never had up, so it's really delightful. <laughs> I'm glad I like my own work. So.
And I'm glad she likes my own. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, thank you very much. Be sure not to miss Essential, an exhibition centered around food, farms, and art with works by regional artists at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts from September 3rd through September 26th.